Welcome to the Clear to Close podcast with your host, local mortgage expert, Ryan Bolton. Ryan has the questions and answers, tips and tricks, do's and don'ts, and expert guests to explain all the steps needed to buy or sell real estate. And now it's time for the Clear to Close podcast. Hey everyone, Ryan Bolton here, local mortgage expert with Patriot Home Loans. And I um, wanted to do a, a different video today because I saw something kind of interesting as who's involved in a real estate transaction. Like who are the players involved in helping you buy a home? So I want to just break down the roles of each person and kind of what they do to help you into home ownership. So the first slide today is kind of our topic. And uh, the goal of the whole show is to get you clear to close, is to help you get that wonderful term that we use in the industry that you are cleared to close, meaning that all the steps are done, the title, the appraisal, all the things we're going to talk about are all done. And now you are finally clear to close that loan and you'll get your keys a few days later. So I want to talk about who are the players, who are the players involved in helping you with a real estate transaction. So let's go to slide number two. And this one will kind of break down the different categories and all of them have different roles. Now, this is in when you're buying a home with a loan, typically. Now, some of these will still be involved whether you're paying cash, depending on or regardless of the type of loan that you're trying to do. But these are the main things you're going to run into whenever you get involved in doing a real estate transaction. And the terminology might be a little bit different in each state, how they record the documents, that kind of thing. But generally, they're going to fall into one of these categories of the people involved in helping you acquire a home. So let's go to slide number three. The first one is mortgage. So you're stuck with me. I'm your first step. I'm going to be the one that's going to help you get pre-approved. I'm going to show you what loan programs you qualify for. We're going to gather documentation for the loan qualification purposes. This is income of or verification of your income. So if you're self-employed, it's different. If you're W-2, it's different. But that's part of my job is to gather up all the paperwork necessary for the certain loan programs. Now, some loan programs don't need as much as others. Some need higher scores, lower scores, different rates. There's a lot of things that go in into the steps to determine what loan you're actually qualified for. Now, some of them might go to a higher loan amount. Some might have a higher payment. Some might have a shorter term. That's part of my job is to sit down, review all the options that are available. Then you can go out and start shopping for a home. So one of the first steps is mortgage. It's the actual financing needed to pay for that home. You can go to my website at ryanbolton.com. You can set up an appointment to meet with me. We can fill an application. We can talk first. That's that's kind of that first step. If you're really looking at buying a home, even if it's a few months away, you really want to start with the mortgage process. So number two, let's go to slide number four, I believe. Now we have the real estate agents. The real estate agents are the ones that are going to represent the seller of the home and then represent you as a buyer. Now, sometimes the seller's agent can represent both, but it's more common to have an agent for both sides of the transaction, one to represent the seller, one to represent the buyer. The buyer's agents, typically the ones I work with the most because that's ones we're doing the loan for as the buyer, not obviously that much with the seller. In fact, I don't really interact too much with the seller's agent or the seller at all other than this initial stage of negotiating. The seller's agent may call me to say, hey, is this person really approved? How much documentation do you have together? So they might have a little bit of questions before they accept the offer. But then after that, we really don't have very much communication with the seller's agent unless they're representing the buyer. So the buyer's agent is really the one that's going to drive you around town, going to tell you about the area. You'll sit down with him or her and say, okay, I got to have three bedrooms or I got to have a two-car garage or I want to be on this school district or whatever it happens to be. That's where the buyer's agent will sit down with you and kind of nail down the home and start the negotiation process on the home. While we on the loan side are also still maybe gathering up some other paperwork, documentation, maybe doing something with a credit report, or a lot of times what we'll do is try to source down payment and have to move some money around while we're doing that while you're actually locking up the home. So the real estate agents are the ones that are going to help find the home, negotiate the price, get it under contract, and then that's when they'll kind of work with me on getting it pushed through to clear to close. So let's go on to the next slide. The next thing you're going to have is the title company. Now, it's kind of funny, title, you know, kind of you kind of think of cars or something like the title of a car, but title or escrow companies depending on the state you're in will be the one that handles all the money coming into the transaction to make sure liens are paid off. They'll check the owner of the home to make sure the seller of the home is the actual seller and not something else. I mean, this will happen if <clears throat> if the home is in a trust, if someone's passed away, if it's in an LLC. So their job is to find out who the actual owner is. And the title company will issue two types of insurance. 
One is called an owner's policy. This is a policy given to the new buyer that says you are now the only owner of this home. There's no other owners that could show up and say, hey, I divorced that guy. He owes me equity. I want the house back. So part of their insurance is to protect anything that a previous owner could have rights to that home. When you do a mortgage loan, the title company will also issue what's called a lender's policy to make sure we are the only loan on the property in the first lien position. Now, there can be other liens. There can be other easements. There can be other things that are on the property. But that lender's policy is to make sure that all other loans from the previous owner are cleared, paid, zeroed as part of that transaction. So your earnest money deposit, your down payment, the lender's loan will all go to the title company. They'll balance where that money's supposed to go, disperse it to the commissions to the agent, to the seller of the home, to the mortgage company of the current seller, replace it with the new loan. So their job is to really clear the title, make sure the owners are the owners, make sure all the liens are accounted for, any judgments, anything like that. And then once the loan uh, fees come in, once the loan paperwork comes in, once all that, they get everything signed, notarized, recorded. So they're really a crucial part of any loan, whether, whether it's a mortgage or whether you're paying cash for the home. So that's a title company. They do the... Whatever's on the title, or excuse me, whatever's on the contract, that's what the instructions are for them to follow. So they make sure that all everything balances and everything makes sense. Everything's notarized, recorded. That's when they can release keys. I mean, all that type of stuff. So for the buyer, the most interaction you usually have with the title companies right at the end. We work with them a lot through the process. They're the ones that are right at the very end. You go in and you sign this stack of papers. It's like this thick, going through everything, getting everything signed, make sure it's all printed, notarized, wherever it needs to be notarized get all the wires in, disperse it out to where it's going to go. So that's where a title company is really a crucial part. I have a couple I really like working with in town. You can pick your title company as a buyer. A lot of times the sellers might dictate or the real estate agent might have a preference because not everybody's in the industry that knows who to work with. In Utah and Nevada, they're very, very regulated on what they can charge. They're very regulated on what fees they can do. So they're very similar. You don't see a huge difference in fees it's usually the service level, how quick they can get the documentation together, how flexible they are on closing, how connected they are with uh, other notaries to be able to do a remote signing. Like I've had signings that were on a cruise ship one time. I had a client that was selling and the, it got delayed and they were leaving town and they had to go to, a, they had to get on their cruise ship. So we had to actually coordinate all of that. That was really interesting. And I've had other times where they've had to meet somewhere to be able to meet with a notary to get things signed, both buyers and sellers. So they both have to sign the documents with the title company, and then they all have to get recorded. We have to get originals back. So if you have somebody who lives across country or something or selling a property, we have to coordinate getting back the originals on some of this stuff. A lot of it can be digital. A lot of it can be filed electronically, but there are certain things that still have to have originals. So a title company is a really big part that your agent or myself will help coordinate with the title company to get the documents we need to be able to make sure your transaction goes smoothly. That's really the only interaction you will have as a client with the title company, usually at the end, right at the end when we're gathering and signing documents and getting everything ready to record. So let's go to the next slide real quick. The next one, I believe, is title company. And next one, uh-oh, it's stuck. <laughs> there it is, home inspection. So once you have the mortgage kind of started, you got the real estate, you got it under contract, the title's been open on the property, that usually gets open pretty quick. One of the next things you'll do is a home inspection. Highly, highly recommend a home inspection because their job is to inspect, test, evaluate, go through that home. And they'll spend anywhere between three hours on the low end to five hours on the high end going through that entire house, plugging every plug, lighting every light switch, checking all the mechanics, going through. A lot of them even have infrared cameras now where they can see if there's a temperature difference between maybe the AC unit and make sure it's blowing out cold air to kind of see if it's working efficiently or just see if there may be areas where heat or cooling is escaping from the home. So they'll check doorways and stuff like that. But really their job is to find something wrong with the house. And I guarantee, you, I don't care if the house is a day old or a hundred years old, they will find something. Now is a deal killer. No, usually it's not. Usually it's a little handyman thing. It's a little, hey, got to fix this. There's a broken tile on the roof for the weather stripping under the door is maybe not sealed up as much. Or it can be stuff that's pretty big, like the roof is really old or the water heater is done or the air AC unit or the heater or the fireplace or whatever it is, is on its last leg or is even not functioning. 
you'll have that happen as well. One tip I, I will say is you want to make sure the utilities are on to make sure you're getting a true home inspection. I've had a lot of them where they've shut it off or winterized or or just turned things off to, as a home's been vacant and utilities aren't on, so they can't test everything. You really want to make sure the home is on, functioning, everything's ready to go, water's back on, so they can check for those things. Because I've seen reports that say, hey, we couldn't test it. Power wasn't on, or the gas wasn't on, or the water wasn't on. Now, sometimes it just turned off at the street, got to turn it back on. But usually home inspectors will check that to just make sure maybe the valve on the, the water's not shut off. But it's something you want to make sure those utilities are back on. If they're living in a home, that's different. But sometimes they're vacant, or they've been a new construction, and those things haven't been turned on yet. So you do want to coordinate that first. It is something where you want to make sure everything's on, the gas is on, water's on, heat's on. Uh, power, all that's on so the home inspection can be as thorough as possible because, again, they're trying to test everything. They're trying to find if there is something wrong with the home, and you really want to make sure you have that test. Now, it can also reopen the negotiations. So if you find out, yeah, the roof's bad or the water heater or dishwasher leaks or something like that, you can go back and renegotiate with the seller and say, well, either lower the price or you want to back out or or fix it. And a lot of times there'll be negotiation that'll open back up with the real estate agents on what those things are. That doesn't mean the seller has to, but that doesn't mean you have to buy the house either. You can say, okay, you know, this is a deal killer for me. I really want this fixed. Didn't know this was going to be an issue and let's move on. Now, one thing I do see that people will do too is they'll add a home warranty to cover if things are maybe a little bit older or if you just want to have that peace of mind that, yeah, everything was working now, but it could break in a month from now or two months from now or four months from now, or maybe you're in the winter and haven't had time to really test the AC or vice versa. You're in the summer and you're not really had a chance to test the furnace. You can get that warranty to kind of cover some of those major repairs, which I highly recommend. And a lot of times the sellers, you can put that in there where the sellers do cover that. Most of them will. I think most home warranties, 500 on the very low end. I think that covers very little up to about a thousand now is what they'll cover on those home warranties. And they're usually for a year. You can get some that are longer, but I think the most common is going to be a one-year uh, warranty. Now, builders will have a separate warranty. Sometimes they'll have ones that are a lot longer on the bigger things on the home builder, uh, but just an existing home will usually have a, a supplemental home warranty program. All right, let's go to the next one. The next one, I believe, is the appraisal. Now, I have a lot of times where people say, okay, I want to, now do I order the appraisal or what, how do we get the appraisal going? And it really is something you want to coordinate with your loan officer and order it through their system. And the reason being is we have certain checks and balances we have to do to use an appraisal. We just can't use any appraisal that comes into our office. They have to be licensed, they have to be approved, and it's something we have to order it through a management company to randomly assign it to an appraiser. Now, some of these laws that kicked in have kind of expired, but now the industry is so used to doing it, we just kind of kept doing it. It was just kind of the way that we do business. It also became just kind of a good practice to go through an AMC to be able to order the appraisal, randomly assign it, and then have the appraisal done. But if you had one done for whatever reason, or the seller had one done, he said, well, I'm going to just use that appraisal. Most of the time you can. It has to be done through this system. And an appraisal is different than a home inspection. With the appraiser, there's kind of two most common you're going to have is either a government one like an FHA or VA, which is ordered a little bit differently, or you're going to have a conventional appraisal. They both have a little different guidelines on what the appraiser has to go out and do. The FHA is a little bit more strict. They have to check a few more things. They have to be a little bit, there's more pages to the report. It's just a little bit more that FHA requires the appraiser to do because really they don't have to see the home inspection. A lot of times lenders don't get even a copy of the home inspection. It's more just, hey, how's the house looking? Really, the appraisal is how is our eyes on the property. They have photos in there, measurements, make sure the square footage is right, the quality of construction, make sure there's not deferred maintenance or things broken, like the plumbing, that kind of thing, and what's included in the house. And so they do a lot of photos as well with FHA. They just go a little bit further, but it's not, not, not a home inspection. They won't go through and test it and certify everything as a home inspector would. So you want to do the home inspection first, make sure it's what you want, renegotiate if there's things that need to be repaired, then order the appraisal, but do that with your lender because they'll have to go through a certain process to order it. Otherwise, you'll pay for an appraisal. You may not be able to use and you have to do another one anyway. So just make sure that uh, you do, do the home inspection. We can help you with that, but that's something you pay for and kind of order and work with the agent on. But then the appraisal is what we want to actually go through and order correctly. That way it just doesn't become an expense that you don't need or an issue where we can't use the appraisal if it's already been done. Even if we end up using the same appraiser, I've seen times where we the seller got an appraisal for whatever reason, a refinance, and maybe it's a little bit old or, or whatever and has a copy of it. 
We also have to have one dated within the date of the contract or within a certain time frame. If it's three or four months old, we usually can't use it. The appraiser has to go back out, take new photos. So usually there's a new fee anyway. So it's just better to talk with your loan officer, coordinate with them on actually ordering the appraisal. So let's go to the next slide real quick. All right, the next one is homeowner's insurance. So as you're going through the process of finding the home, you want to start getting your quotes on homeowner's insurance. This is something very vital to make sure that we have the coverage we need to offer the loan. That's one of the conditions we're going to have, and just to check what the cost is going to be for that. Now, Utah and Nevada is very common to have an escrow account where the payment is included in the mortgage. So you make your principal and interest payment, you make a payment to an escrow account within the mortgage company that covers taxes and insurance. Usually HOAs are separate, just like your utilities are separate, but a lot of lenders will include the principal and interest on the loan, the taxes in Utah they're due once a year, and the insurance, which is also due once a year. But at closing, you'll pay that premium for the year, then you'll make 12 payments into the escrow account with your monthly payment every month, and then another payment to renew happens at the end of 12 months. So we have to collect that premium up front. We have to know what it is. We collect it usually at closing. Now, I've had times where people do pay it. Maybe it's part of their auto insurance, or they just prepay it there, and we can do that as well. But a lot of times, we don't want to have the policy kind of going before you own the house, so we just kind of coordinate with title and everything, the date we're closing, let the insurance company know, okay, here's the effective date of the policy, which is the day we close, so that way we're not paying for coverage when you don't even own the home. So it's part of coordinating all this at the very end with title companies to make sure that that policy exists and that it's enforced, those types of things. So you want to start getting your quotes when you kind of nail down that home. And it's usually good to check with whoever has your auto insurance because usually there'll be a multi-policy discount, home and auto. They always talk about bundling. You know, you have those two together with one company. It's usually a better rate than if they're standalone policies. Not always. I've seen times where maybe there's something with the cars that make the policy really high and doesn't help with the house, or maybe they're more specialized in auto loans and home. But generally, I would say huge percentage home and auto together will give you a better rate on both. There'll be a discount for both of them. But you want to check your coverages. So with the homeowner's policy, you're going to have the dwelling coverage. This is if you have a fire or, or something happens with, and damage the home that needs to be rebuilt. You know, a car catches on fire in the garage and burns the house down. You're going to have a coverage for the dwelling itself. But a very crucial part of a homeowner's policy is liability coverage. This will cover theft. This will cover trips and falls. This will cover just a liability on anything that can happen with that property, especially if you have pools or dogs or something like that, that falls more under that policy within the homeowner's policy. So you want to make sure you have that coverage correctly. And I can't tell you, I mean, right now, look at your homeowner's policy. There's so many things you can do to bump up that liability coverage that is not very much more a month. You can even add some other umbrella coverages that are built into homeowner's policy that are cheaper than just a general liability on everything else anyway. So really take a look at those coverages. It's where the areas where I see people are undercovered a little bit with general liability when it's so it's so cost effective to build it into a homeowner's policy. Also, what you want to do on the dwelling coverage, if you haven't checked it for a while, you really want to make sure you have adequate coverage there as well. If you bought your home five years ago, six years ago, and haven't really looked at the dwelling coverage, you might be underinsured for that part of it. Now, you'll see they'll kind of bump it up every year. They want to make sure that they have the right coverage for the cost of construction, the cost of labor, the cost of materials if they have to rebuild your home as well. So a lot of policies will have a little bit of a buffer. They'll go a little bit above to, to, uh, to offset that, but it really is very inexpensive insurance for what it covers. So you don't want to be short. I mean, an extra 100 bucks a year can make a big difference on either general liability or making sure your dwelling coverage is correct. I remember a story, it's probably, well, it's probably 10 years ago now, where a guy just hadn't checked his insurance for a while, and they were steadily increasing it. But with home prices going up so much further than that, he only had like 300000 in actual dwelling coverage, and his house was worth like 800000 Now, it includes the land, so you, know, you don't have to really insure the land on the dwelling coverage, but they couldn't rebuild the house for what he actually had in his dwelling coverage is really an awkward, hard thing to say that, hey, you can't rebuild the home that burnt down. You've got to build something smaller. You know, you cut corn, you had to build something a lot different for what you had left over. So it's just good to check that, especially if you haven't for a while. Hopefully your insurance agent's doing a yearly review. Then they're not just trying to sell you more insurance. I mean, part of it's that, obviously, <laughs> they sell insurance. But it is something you want to make sure the coverage is right. And it's such a cost, such a small cost saving or difference to really kind of look at bumping that up just a little bit. 
So I highly recommend if you haven't even looked at it for a long time, just take a look at what your dwelling coverage is, especially in, in comparison to what the home is worth to make sure if you really do need that coverage that it's actually there. I don't think there's anything worse than having insurance, than paying on it for years and years and years, and then when you actually do have to use it, there's not enough there. That's uh, that's just sucks. I mean, there's nothing around it. That just sucks, especially when you could add so little to it to make sure that the coverage there is accurate. So I think that's it for slides. Let's double check. I think that was the last slide. Maybe. Oh. <laughs> it just likes to freeze up on us today. All right. Yeah. So those are the players involved in helping you buy a home. Now, if you're paying cash, it's a little bit different, but in most cases, you're still going to use the agents. You're still going to need homeowner's insurance. You're still going to need a title company involved. You just might not need this guy. But if you are going to pay cash for a home, you might want to still check out your mortgage options. And the reason I say that is, is I'm a big advocate of being able to diversify those funds. Yes, interest rates are higher than they were a few years ago, but it still makes sense to look at putting more money down and not 100%. It makes more sense to be able to say, okay, let's put X amount down, have the rest in savings, emergency, pay off other debts, retirement. There's just way more places you can put that money than just on one home. Buy two homes, buy three homes with the same amount of cash that you would put on the house. And I'm also a big believer that that if you have to get to that money, so if you you pay, it's $400,000 house and you pay cash for it, right? If you need that money back, how do you get it? You have to sell or refinance the home. Well, what if you can't sell or don't want to sell, obviously? What if you can't get a loan or what if rates are even worse? Or what if the terms aren't available or underwriting guidelines are different? Or there's just so many more what ifs than what you know you can get today. And if you get a $200,000 loan and keep $200,000 in the bank, then you have a little bit more Diverse, or a little bit more diversified in what you're trying to do. Plus, it's something where if you have the 200000 in the bank, you can just use that to make the payment every month. So as the balance is going down, you're kind of adding to it, and it's something where you might get a better rate of return on the 200000 sitting here than even the interest rate that you're getting. So it's something where I, I'm a big believer in having that cash flow. I've seen so many times where people will pay cash, and a year later, they're pulling money back out. Or they're doing something to get some of the money back out because the rate is cheaper than any other type of debt that's out there. And I just think having that security of having the money in the bank can be better than having equity that you can't get to. But there's a discipline factor with it. There is definitely some things we want to sit down. But if you have somebody that's looking at a family member downsizing or something like that, they're looking at reverse mortgages, they're looking at other stuff, I'd love to be able to show you some of these concepts and how they actually apply to your specific situation. But a lot of times having a thousand dollar payment and 200 grand to make that payment basically makes you debt free for the next 20 years. So it's something where, and while you're waiting for that money to go pay the payment, you're making the interest on it. And if you need to get to it, it's a lot easier to get to. It's a lot more secure to get to. I, I, I've done this for a lot of people over the years, especially in Southern Utah. You have a lot of people moving here, bringing equity with them, bringing the home they sold for whatever in California or New York or wherever it is. And they're coming here with a lot of equity that they're able to put down on these homes, but then they don't have anything left over. I've just seen so many times where that can be a pretty scary situation. If then you are trying to do a loan where you've retired, your income's changed, or or now all you're doing is kind of living off the interest income and it's harder to qualify for a loan. And all of a sudden now you got all this equity you can't get to. And something happens with the transmission of the car. There's a medical expense. You're not, something pops up or just not having that security of having that money in the bank. I think is is better having that than having a bunch of equity you can't get to. But everybody's going to be different. Everybody already has their other savings plans. Other Everybody has their income sources when they retire that might be a little bit different. But I just think it, it's good to look at those numbers and not just assume, okay, I sold this house for four hundred. I'm going to go pay $400,000 for a house. There, it, it may make sense to at least look at some sort of mortgage loan. So check out my website, ryanbolton.com. You can book an appointment right there on my website. You can apply we can review all your options without having to pull a credit report or do all those types of things. So you can look at my calendar right there on the website. You can book an appointment. We can sit down and review everything over the phone before you do an application, before you have to pull credit and do all those things. You'll be able to get a better idea where you're at and what loan programs you might be able to qualify for. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, we're always looking at having some guests on the show. If you'd like to talk about mortgages or anything in the real estate world, I'd love to talk to you about that type of stuff. But... Uh, yeah, I mean, we are just about out of time, and I got nothing left. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess we'll uh, keep talking. So check out my website, ryanbolt.com. Love doing mortgages. It's been 
a fun industry to be a part of. I tell you what, I've been doing this now, 1999. I've seen and done it all. And it just surprises me how fun this can be and how you're dealing with people that are dealing with a really nervous situation. You know, they're dealing with uh, buying a home for the first time or upgrading or relocating and all the exciting things that comes with. It. And I get to do that every day. It's just so much fun being part of the mortgage industry. Yeah, yeah, it's got some stresses. Yeah, you're dealing with moving parts. You're dealing with all kinds of different things. But I tell you what, it's a great industry to be a part of. And I'd love to earn your business. I'd love to help you with a mortgage loan, whether you're buying, building, refinancing, private money, fix and flip, all that. Check out my website, ryanbolton.com. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> This has been the Clear to Close podcast. Please submit your comments, questions, and topics for future episodes to cleartoclosepod at gmail.com. That's clear the number two, closepod at gmail.com or ryanbolton.com. Please like, follow, and share. And until next time, this is the Clear to Close podcast. The views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of Patriot Home Mortgage, Equal Housing Lender, NMLS number 299717. This has been a production from a podcast studio.